So, let me get this straight. Vampires are gothic, romantic, lovelorn denizens of the night. Equal parts seductive and monstrous, they feed on the blood of humans, having lost their humanity themselves. They're immortal, tragic, and cursed. So, this vampire is 200 years old, and in order to blend in, he bums around from city to city, going to public high schools and hitting on 17-year-old girls. And when the sunlight hits him, instead of exploding, he sparkles. Man, this has got to be the only fandom whose main books sound like their own fanfiction. When we're creating creatures of fantasy, it is so important to look at the little details as much as the big picture. Otherwise, you end up with a character that is on some kind of a list that requires he stays 100 yards away from a school. I'm DC Ferguson, and this is the World Building Dojo. In the realm of science fiction and fantasy, there is very little difference between aliens and fantasy creatures. Both are products of our minds, both have urban myths and legends that surround them, and for our purposes, both can feel very foreign or strange while building off of what we know that makes characters tick. So in that regard, the Predator and Dracula have more in common with each other than they do with us. Both are hunters of humans, savage and powerful. One comes from beyond our world, the other from its ancient past. Both of them have motivation to do what they do, and neither of them think it's evil the, uh, what they're doing. Yet we would consider them both frightening and monstrous. And that's how I suggest you approach the concept of your fantasy creature, every single time. They should come from a culture, and that culture is defined not by what we tell the audience, but what we show them in their words and actions. Let the character be their own representative of their upbringing. Don't ruin all that meaty character development with info dumps and exposition. Now, the obvious example here is going to be the Lord of the Rings trilogy. It handles both elves and dwarves as coming from their own culture and society that is at one time incredibly similar to humans, but just as alien and different enough to separate them. Take, for example, the longevity of elves. By living for hundreds of years longer than humans, the romance between Aragorn and Arwen creates this whole mess of problems for her father. And that's a very human situation where dad doesn't think that someone's right for his daughter. At the same time, one of the factors that makes Aragorn a bad choice for a maid is that if he dies of old age in 30 or 40 years, Arwen will still look as young as the day she married him. In an elven sense, romance with humans is fleeting and can only set you up for heartbreak with their short lifespans. You see the duality in there? It's a mix of both relatable and very alien at the same time. Of course, you don't have to go to the lengths of creating a fictional language over the course of 40 years to get your mileage out of fantasy races. A lot of that work has already been done for you, but that's a double-edged sword, and it brings us to our next point. If we're creating our own fantasy creatures or aliens from scratch, then we have totally different world building concerns, and we'll get to that shortly. What we're talking about here is what you do when your fantasy races are something that's been used before, like elves, dwarves, fairies, or dragons. It's not only okay, but almost expected that when you're using these familiar fantasy creatures, there's some expectation you've been informed by the cultures and tropes that we've seen for them before. This is both a blessing and a curse. You're not reinventing the wheel here, so you don't have to go to extraordinary lengths to explain what an elf is, for example. However, and this is the major pitfall, you can also rest on your laurels and assume the reader's familiar enough with the concept of elves that you don't really need to flesh out their society in your world. But, BC, I'm using the commonly accepted version of an elf. Well, guy who talks to your monitor, I have bad news for you. If you're writing with characters from a fantasy race that relies on the reader knowing previous representations from other works, you're basically writing a fanfiction. The point here is that at least some measure of depth needs to be present to show the culture of these creatures in your world, not someone else's. For that, we're going to get into an example that may be controversial depending on your opinion of the film. We're going to talk about the 2017 fantasy film Bright, starring Will Smith. We're not so much concerned with the story, but with its handling of orcs as a race in this film. See, pretty much everyone knows orcs, or something like them, from even a casual viewing of fantasy. But what Bright does in this film is it shows you what their orcs look like in this world, and the film is much better for it. 
In this film, orcs were the odd man out, as it were, a race that supported the Dark Lord centuries past while he was defeated by the other eight races of Earth. Humans detest orcs, and as such, their culture is isolationist. Their clans can be likened to modern gangs. Say what you will about the film, but their handling of this culture was uniquely their own. This is an important rest lesson. There's no resting on laurels for you, buddy. So get in the lab and make your fairies your fairies. You hear? So we've talked about what to avoid, now let's talk about how to do it. If you've seen this video before on technology and magic, then some of this is going to sound familiar. In the same way that we treat dwarves and orcs as aliens in the first section, we must also consider the impact of their culture on the rest of the world. What do I mean by that? Well, if you have a race of people with magical powers, who loves them? Who fears them? How does the world view what they can do? Can anyone else do it? These critical questions are super important. It's not enough to sit down and say, elves live for a thousand years, without considering the impact that has on the rest of the world. That means that the same elven apothecary, for example, could have been visited by the same human bloodline for over 25 generations, assuming an average medieval human lifespan of around 35. Those early humans on your world may have thought these people gods. Heck, elves might have even wondered that themselves. After all, they couldn't have understood death until the first of their kind died of old age a thousand years after birth. So, now that I've got you thinking in this mode, we can start attacking our fantasy creatures from different angles. When we're creating them, we're not looking just at the original spin we bring to them, or the powers we give them, or how cool they are, but we're also looking about how their very existence shapes the rest of our world building around them. This kind of interconnectedness is what makes your world feel more real. It shows that you understand the implications of what you've created. Basically, it answers what-if questions before the audience even has a chance to ask them. Nothing feels more realized than a fantasy world that has a history before the start of page one. And that brings us to our final point. One could say that dilution of a good story happens with most film sequels, and by and large that is the case. But if you were never able to put your finger on why, here's one aspect of it. So. We'll go into a semi-deep cut this week, and that's the 1987 sci-fi masterpiece, Predator. We follow a team of elite military rescue specialists, led by Arnold Schwarzenegger, into a jungle in Central America. When they get there to rescue hostages, they find they're being hunted by an alien creature for sport in what amounts to an intergalactic big game hunt. The thing is, this film is so grounded in the real world and the alien is the sole hunter. It has no speaking lines. It's just terror incarnate. So this film is one part military drama, one part sci-fi, and one part suspense thriller. It juggles all of these with a pretty deft hand. The thing is, it did its job too well. As studio execs go, being well received and making a boatload of cash onboards it for a sequel. The thing is though, you can tell the film was never written to be anything but a standalone movie. Subsequent attempts to make sequels have not only further watered down the race of predators, but tacked on additional bits to flesh out their culture. What you're left with is a hodgepodge of bad to mediocre follow-ups that have never been as good as the original, while the character of the predator is now a Frankenstein monster of nine different writers' takes on it. There's an important lesson in here for us, and that's in your world building. One-shot or standalone titles simply don't require the same level of work that a series does. But if you plan to write a series, make damn sure you've fleshed it out properly beforehand. If you're finding that there's enough meat on the bone at the end of your story that the saga's worth continuation, get your butt back in the lab and hammer out the world more before you type the end. You might just find that you can use the work established in your first title to set up or better flesh out what you plan to bring in follow-ups. As for how that relates to your fantasy creatures, it's so critical to understand how your creatures work, look, and behave long before you get started. The last thing you want is to be adding on new ideas or concepts later on, because as we've talked before, you run the risk of painting yourself into a corner with continuity errors. A simple example of this would be to find out that, let's say, the Predator's homeworld has an atmosphere that's inhospitable to humans. Now, let's say that we, as writers, slip that in there so we can keep the fight restricted to the space station above the planet. Easy peasy, right? Except that one throwaway line now makes us re-examine 
all of the Predator films. How can he hunt us on Earth and breathe just fine, but we can't go to wor uh, his world and breathe on his? See, that's a question we're asking of the writer, not the story, and there's a problem. I guess you could say that's a long-winded way of teaching you the importance of preparing your creatures ahead of time, but it's also an important lesson on how sequels can dilute your wonderful babies if you don't raise them right the first time. Fantasy creatures, or aliens, should be treated in much the same way, and bringing them to life means doing the hard work. Making sure they have a culture, a history, and uniqueness makes your characters pop and resonate, and only serves to add to your world building. So, I totally suck. I got slammed with a sinus infection, and I was just generally gross for a bit, but we're back. In the meantime, thanks to everyone who showed some love to the Master of Kung Fu and, front and Friendship in the contest last month, the winner is this adorable lady right here, Catherine Griffin from the Carolinas. She was so kind as to let me plaster her everywhere, so I went ahead and gave her Heaven's Crest and the Pentagon Codex as well. Isn't she a sweetheart? So, if you haven't already done so, don't forget to join my mailing list and hear all the latest goings on about the Dragon's Dream Saga, and stay tuned. Book 4 is coming soon, and we're going to be doing a cover reveal ahead of the release. Don't forget to like and subscribe to hear about new videos, and as always, I'm DC Ferguson, now have fun and get crafting.